Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning. Hey, I'm Joel, and you guys are probably sick of seeing me at this point. You're like, when's Pastor Marcus going to be back, right? So uh, Pastor Marcus was actually going to speak this week, but he had some back problems this week, so be praying for his back. And he was like, man, I think they might actually have to like post me up there. So rather than have Natalie and me standing next to him, holding him up here while he speaks, he's in the front row, but he's here. So he'll be speaking next week. But I'm super excited that I get the honor of continuing to talk in this series. Live wise. Wisdom is one of my things that I feel is most important to talk about in this world. So we're going to talk today about wisdom, but I want to make a real quick reminder that this is, I, I said last week was the last week to sign up for small groups and I was wrong. Actually, this week is the last week to sign up for small groups. So I want to encourage you guys, don't bolt out of here as soon as service is over. Head over to the pavilion before you leave. Hang out with some people and get signed up for one of our small groups. Because I think that is one of the most important things you can do for your spiritual growth is get connected with other Christians. Not just here on Sunday morning, but throughout the week. Cool? It's true. All right. So I want to tell you a cool story of something I did last Sunday. So last Sunday, right after I finished speaking, I raced down to the airport and I got on a plane to fly to Guatemala, Central America. Now, I was trying to get to a concert that started at 7.30. So there's this band called Petra. And anybody, or some of you are like, whoa, Petra. They were they're having a 50th anniversary concert in Guatemala. And yeah, it's like it was a bunch of like old guys like in their nostalgia. We're all like, rock. <laughs> Anyways, they had a concert down there. It's in Guatemala. I grew up in Guatemala, Central America. So I was like, how cool if I could go back to Guatemala and see this concert. But I knew that there was no room for mistakes. So as soon as church was over, uh, man, I bolted down to the airport. But it was crazy. Everything clicked. And I landed at 6.50 in Guatemala. And the concert was supposed to start at 7.30. So I ran through immigration. Thank goodness they didn't catch the stuff I had in my backpack. But I mean, I I was going to a concert after all. But um, I'm just kidding. Totally kidding. It was a Christian concert. But (laughs) so anyways, I show up at 720. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to make the concert. The opening band was supposed to go on at six and the the concert was starting at 730. I'm like, this is a miracle. I made it here with 10 minutes to spare. So I walk in, I go get my ticket. The girl's taking forever to give me my ticket. I'm like, come on. I'm like, is the concert starting? She's like, no, they're just about to start. I'm like, I can't believe I made this. I finally got my ticket, got my wristband, walked in. I was like, who are those people on the stage? (laughs) That's not Petra. And they're like, oh, that's the opening band. It's like, oh my gosh. They started an hour and a half late. So not only did I get to see Petra, I got to see some no-name open band that I raced down there to see. But it was super exciting. (laughs) Anyways, I'm down there in Guatemala, and Emily's like, hey, since you're gone, why don't you just stay gone? So I was like... Okay, you know, no, no problems. Everything's good here, but she was just like, just kind of nice having you gone. So I'm down there, and I was planning to stay a little longer, and I get a call on Tuesday from a studio in Houston. Now, a couple weeks ago, I recorded the audio book for my most recent book, Keep It Light. I went into the studio and recorded it, and the way you do it in the studio is you have an iPad, and they've got your book, the one you wrote, right, and you're reading it out loud, and as you read it, if you make a mistake, you can just stop, and you can tell the, the producer, he'll rewind the, I guess it's not a tape now, I don't know how you rewind a digital, whatever they do, he'll rewind it, and then you'll kind of fix your mistakes, so we're fixing the mistakes as we go, and I'm catching them, when it's all done, he's like, all right, I'm gonna, I want to have you come back in a few weeks to make the corrections, and I was like, <laughs> corrections, I was like, we fixed them all, like, I mean, I did it. I did a pretty good job. And, and he's like, no, there's always things to fix. And I was like, yeah, for everybody else. Well, he called me Tuesday. He's like, hey, I need you to come back here and fix these mistakes. And I was like, what mistakes? He's like, I told you, there's always corrections to be made. I'm like, well, shoot, I'm in Guatemala. So I fly back to Houston, get a rental car, and drive down to the studio. And I'm thinking... Did I do this for nothing? They're clear, surely there's no mistakes on this. Like, I mean, I heard myself as I was reading it. We were correcting him as we went. And he got this list of mistakes I made. And I was like, <laughs> how did I mess up that sentence? There's no way I messed up that sentence. Plus, I wrote that sentence, for goodness sake. Like, and he's like, well, hey, put the headphones on. So he locks me in the little cabin there in the studio. And I put on the headphones. And he plays back my voice. 
And I'm like, oh my gosh, I screwed that up. <laughs> how did I mess that up and not catch it? Like I was wrong about how I did that and I didn't even see it. Like I'm, I'm reading the words and what I said is the opposite of what I read and I didn't even catch it. And it was really kind of jolting because, you know, it's one thing to go like, ah, no, there's no way it's wrong. And then they actually play back your own words to you and you're like, hey, that's not what I meant. It got me thinking about every one of us in our lives. We've all got areas of our life. You ready for this? I know this is going to be jolting to some of you. But there are going to be some areas of your life where you have it wrong right now, but you don't even think you do. Every one of us has areas where there's something in our life that needs to be adjusted, maybe tweaked a little bit. We're like, ah, there's no problem here. I'm me. But yet, maybe there's voices around you saying, hey, um, you need to really work on this, right? Maybe it's your spouse. And, and she's saying, hey, you need to work on this. And you're like, Psh, no way. And, and sometimes we go, all right, well, maybe they're right, but I do not like her tone. That tone, no, I'm not even, nope, not going to listen. I don't like the way, you could have said it nicer. Why didn't you have to be so mean about it? Right? You, I, or, or maybe you don't like the person who told you. Somebody said, hey, this, and you go, why should I listen to you? I know the way you think about this or that. Or you're, you're, you're messed up over here, and yet they're telling you something that's true, no matter how messed up their life is. They're telling you something that's true, and you're going, well, I don't need to listen to them. But then kind of in your heart, you're going, well, maybe I, I should. But then that would mean that, wait, that would mean I, I'm wrong. Oh, and I don't, I don't, who wants to admit they're wrong? Well, here's, here's a really key point this morning. So in order to grow, you have to have been wrong about something. Because if you're perfect and you got it all down right now, that means you're God. And I'd like to talk to you after the service. <laughs> but unless you're God, we've all got areas that need to be fixed. So we've been looking at wisdom. And wisdom is the right application of knowledge. So last week, we talked about the fact, I'm going to do a quick recap of last week, that you can ignore reality, but you can't avoid the consequences of ignoring reality. There's this reality that God has put into place in the world, some principles, some rules he put into place. He says it's always this way. And you can ignore those realities but at some point, you're going to come face to face, and you're going to smack into the wall that is reality. And when that happens, we go to one of two ways. We either go, ouch, I think I need to work on something. Or we go, reality sucks. Reality's the problem. But reality is not the problem. Reality is reality. And we can get bitter and angry about the nature of reality and just make our life miserable. Or we can say... Clearly, there's something I need to work on to get my life in line with reality, which was our second point last week. Wisdom is the path to living in harmony with reality, specifically God's wisdom. God created our reality. He created the world we live in. He created the principles we live that, that work all the time. And if you want to live in harmony with that and not be banging up against the wall all the time... You listen for what he has to say in the word of God and you live in line with that reality and we're constantly course correcting to make sure we're in line with the reality he, he shared. And here's the beautiful thing about it. It helps you stop unnecessary suffering. Now, there's some suffering in life that is just part of life. We live in a fallen world and there's this really uncomfortable verse I don't like in Acts. I wish it wasn't there. It says, through much suffering, we enter the kingdom of God. I wish it said through much Krispy Kreme donuts, we enter the kingdom of God, but it doesn't. For whatever reason, God has chosen suffering as a tool to help us be transformed. I think it's because suffering makes us wake up a little bit and we go, whoa, something's up here. So there's some suffering you're not going to get around. And the best thing you can do is keep proper perspective in that. But then there's other suffering in life that let's be honest, we are our own worst enemy sometimes. We create our own suffering because we do dumb stuff that goes against what God put in place. And when you use wisdom and you choose to always listen to wisdom and respond to wisdom when it's given to you, you'll get yourself more and more in line with God's principles. And you can't stop unnecessary or stop necessary suffering, but you can stop a lot of unnecessary suffering in your life. So we talked last week about how King Solomon, uh, he talks about wisdom, and we, we, we kind of compared it to this book that I read by a guy named Carla Chipola, and Chipola says there's four kinds of people in the world, and he lays it out one way, but I think he's basically explaining what King Solomon says. 
Chipola says there are four kinds of people in the world. There are people who are helpless, or what I think King Solomon would call the naive. And the naive are people who help others, but hurt themselves. There are a lot of people that, man, they're, they're, they're just, because they don't know, they don't be, maybe they don't believe there are people that would want to hurt them. They actually allow others to take advantage of them and use them for b- bad purposes oftentimes because they just refuse to believe there would be people that would want to do anything evil. And that's just naivete. King Solomon says there are people that want to do evil and wicked things. And you've got to pay attention. Otherwise, you're going to end up helping others while you're hurting yourself. Well, then there's another type of person. Chipola, the author, and King Solomon kind of match up. Chipola calls them stupid. I think the better word is foolish. What King, King Solomon calls is foolish is somebody who hurts themselves and at the same time hurts others. Then there's these other kind of people called the bandits. And they're the ones who help themselves and they hurt others. King Solomon calls them the wicked. Okay? Now, the wicked love to take advantage of the naive because you can't believe there'd be somebody wicked. And you'd be like, why would anybody want something bad for me? And they're taking advantage of you and they're telling you all this stuff and they're taking advantage of you and you're paying the price for it and you're hurting yourselves. Meanwhile, they'll help, they're helping themselves because we refuse to believe there's wicked people. And then there's what we call, Chipola calls it the intelligent, King Solomon calls it the wise. And the wise are people who are always seeking to not only help themselves and their family, but help others at the same time. And that's what wisdom does. It raises all of us at the same time. Chipola says one of the important rules to understand is this. There are always going to be more foolish, or he calls them stupid people in the population than you can count for. Because anybody that has any amount of intelligence would go, why in the world would you do something that not only hurts others, but hurts yourself? And the reality is there are some people who just refuse to look at the reaction, the results of their decisions, or maybe they don't understand them. They say, if you do this, this is going to happen. If you do this, everything's going to tank and you're going to suffer and everybody's going to suffer. And they're like, well, I'm just living, man. I'm just trying to live. That's a fool. And the reality is there are fools in the world, but we do not want to be those people. We want to be people who are wise. And I want to talk about one of the greatest decisions you can make today when it comes to wisdom to help make sure you're not a fool and you're not naive and for sure you're not going to fall into the camp of the wicked. You ready for this? All right. So here's what King Solomon says. We're going to look at Proverbs 9. Now, I've been encouraging you guys this whole month. We've been encouraging you to read through the Proverbs. So there's 31 Proverbs and there's 30 days in September. So what I want to encourage you to do is for the day that matches up with the chapter, read it. So today you'd be reading Proverbs 8. I'm going to read today from Proverbs 9. So tomorrow I'm setting you up for a win tomorrow as you read together as a family Proverbs 9. We're going to go over what Proverbs 9 says. And here's what it says. Wisdom has built her house. She has set up its seven pillars. Now, a bunch of questions about what seven pillars mean. Some people believe there's seven things that Solomon unpacks here. The general consensus is that seven pillars are what it took to build a strong home back in, in, the, in the days of King Solomon's time. So they'd build these seven retaining pillars that would hold up the house. So she's saying she's got a strong house, right? Wisdom has this really strong house that's going to stand. She's prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She's also set her table. She's done the work. She's got everything ready for you. She sent out her servants and she calls from the highest point of the city. Let all who are simple come to my house. The beautiful thing is wisdom is always calling out to you. It's always calling out and available to you. Okay. You've just got to seek it. In fact, in James, it says this, if any of you lacks wisdom, all you got to do is ask God and he'll give it to you. Even if you've made a bunch of dumb mistakes up to this point, you go, oh, what a mess I've made. It says he doesn't even hold that against you. It says, if you ask God, he will give you wisdom. Wisdom's always calling out, right? So it goes on to those who have no sense. She says, hey, Look, you've been making some dumb decisions, but come here. Eat my food and drink the wine I've mixed. Let's leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of insight. Whoever corrects a mocker invites insults. Whoever rebukes the wicked incurs abuse. Do not rebuke mockers or they will hate you. Rebuke the wise and they will love you. Instruct the wise and they'll be wiser still. Teach the righteous and they will add to their learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and, and, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Now, this fear of the Lord, I used to think that means, meant that God was waiting around the corner to beat me with a baseball bat for all of my sins, okay? Understand this. If you're in right relationship with Christ and you've given your life to Him, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. God is not mad at you. So what fear of the Lord in this context means is a healthy reverence for the fact that you've been given one life and God expects you to do something good with it and he wants you to use it to make wise choices and not only raise up yourself, but raise up others at the same time. 
So we're living with this constant realization, I want to make sure I'm pleasing the Lord with my life. For through wisdom, your days will be many and years will be added to your life. If you're wise, your wisdom will reward you. But if you're a mocker, a mocker is somebody who actually makes fun of wisdom. They make fun of people who are trying to be wise. You alone will suffer. Now, here's an interesting thing. Remember we talked about how wisdom has built her house and she's calling out? Well, here's a comparison he makes. He says, folly is an unruly woman. She is simple and knows nothing. And she sits at the door of her house. You got these two houses. You got the wise woman who's built the house and you got this folly over here person. She's on the seat at the highest point of the city and she's calling for attention too. She's saying, let all who are simple come to my house. She says, to those who have no sense, stolen water is sweet. Stealing stuff, it's fun. It's kind of cool. Food eaten in secret, it's delicious. Ripping people off and stealing stuff, it's fun. But little do they know that the dead are there, that her guests are deep in the realm of the dead. Ouch. Now, I want to, I want to, we're going to nerd out on the Bible for a second here, all right? So if you're like, whoa, what, this is way heavy for me. Hang on with me. I'm going to teach you about a little secret in reading the Bible, okay? So you ready for this? Sometimes you read the Bible and you're like, what are they talking about? This, this chapter specifically uses a literary device called chiastic structure, okay? Don't get lost in the terms. Chi is just the Greek word for, for uh, the X letter that they used. It's the K, uh, K sound, right? And chiastic structure is this. Like we usually in the West think A, B, C, D, in the East, using a chiastic structure, which much of the Proverbs is written in and much of the, Revel- the book of Revelation is written in, they have two thoughts. And they'll start with the thought and end with an opposing thought. And in the middle, they'll put the most important thought. So they go, wisdom has built her house. She set up seven pillars. Let all who are simple come to my house. That's the first part. And then you go across same thought. The opposing idea is that folly is doing the same thing. Hey, all you simple people come here. And then right in the middle is the most important message. So when you're reading something for chiastic structure, you read the beginning, you read the end, and then you go, all right, what's at the dead middle of this? Because this is what's most important in this passage. Little side thought, what I think is fascinating, little personal opinion. The Bible is a huge book. It's got all these 66 books. Genesis is a super important book. The Revelation, the last book of the Bible, is a super important book. What do you find when you get right to the middle of your Bible? Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, which are called the wisdom literature, the wisdom books. And I almost wonder if God was saying, hey, I'm going to strategically position this here because of chiastic structure, the way we think in the East. This, this, the most important things in the dead middle. So that's how you read this passage, all right? Some of y'all feel way smarter already, right? (laughs) So the first point is this, okay? This is the first point as we read about folly. There will always be people willing to tell you what you want to hear. But just because someone affirms you, it doesn't mean they actually love you. There are always going to be people who are willing to tell you, hey, you're okay, everything's fine. Tell you, you're just great just as you are, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's loving that they're affirming what you are. Imagine this, if a parent was like, little Johnny, you are so good at sticking your hand on that hot oven and burning it. You're so good at that, sweetheart. And the kid burns his hand. You're like, oh, kid, isn't that wonderful? That's so beautiful. That's so sweet. You're not broken. Everything's good. And the kid's like, oh, like put your hand back up there. It's all good for you. And the, what a horrible parent that would be if they did that, right? But yet we all have people around us who will tell us what they think we want to hear. Sometimes it's to manipulate us. And make no mistake, there are people who want to manipulate and control you because they're wicked. And, and, and we're a fool to look for people who only affirm us. I can't tell you how many people. I talk to them, they've left the church, and I go, well, why'd you leave? And they go, well, they started judging me. And when you get down to the bottom of it, what it was, I said, what do you mean they judged you? Well, I was dating this guy, and they said that blah, 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 and he wasn't the right one for me. And I, who are they to judge my lifestyle? And I go, were they judging you, or did they see something in you, greatness in you, you couldn't even see in yourself because you've been lied to, you've been beat down, And you can't even see how great God has put something in you. And you're living far short of it. And you called it judging you. And you ran away. But it was really somebody who loved you. And that's why one of my favorite Proverbs is this right here. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. But an enemy multiplies kisses. You know you've got a real friend when they're willing to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And and it's uncomfortable because people will tell you what what you need to hear and you don't like it. 
My wife tells me, Joelle, you were way too harsh with our daughter. And I'm like, yeah, but she needed to hear that. She goes, yes, she did, but she did it wrong. And I get mad and I bless her and I'm like, and then I walk away and go, "Mm, maybe I was too harsh. But I know she loves me because she's willing to confront me. And just because someone's willing to confront you and not affirm your behavior, it doesn't mean they don't love you. It actually probably means they do love you. If you're looking for everybody to affirm you, you're not going to go very far in this life. Heck, you're not going to make it in church because our job here is not to affirm ourselves. Our job is to find out what the word of God says and make sure we get our lives in line with it. And I'm working on it. You're working on it. Pastor Marcus is working on it. Natalie's got it down, but sometimes she gets off, right? I'm just kidding. (laughs) We're all working on it together. And what that means is from time to time, somebody's going to have to call us out and we have to go, you know what? I'm going to receive that. I don't like it, but I'm going to be willing to receive correction because Just because somebody affirms me, it doesn't mean they love me. They actually may be trying to destroy me or manipulate me. So we're going to look at this chiastic structure. Here, here, there's folly and there's wisdom. What's right in the middle? And here's what uh, King Solomon says. Whoever corrects a mocker invites insult. Whoever rebukes the wicked incurs abuse. Do not rebuke mockers or they will hate you. Rebuke the wise and they will love you. Instruct the wise and they'll be wiser still. Teach the righteous and they will add to their learning. Now, this is fascinating because I think what he's saying here is if you feel like you need to confront somebody, just prepare yourself. It's not going to go well because who likes being corrected? When you feel like it's time to say something, it's not going to go well. But here's the thing. We have to take the risk of it not going well because otherwise it's like we're affirming somebody sticking their hand on the burning, the burner, right? And this is where it gets tricky sometimes. Because, you know, you have that friend that was dating somebody that you didn't really like, and then they get engaged. And you're like, oh, man. You're like, oh, I'm so happy for you. You're engaged. And then they break up, and you're like, oh, man, that's good. I never really liked him anyways. And they're like, what? Well, why didn't you tell me? And then they get back together, and you're really screwed. Because they're like, well, you didn't like him in the first place. And you're like, what am I? It's tricky. It's hard sometimes to tell the truth to people. Telling the truth is probably the most daring adventure in our world right now. The willingness to tell the truth, well, you'll pay a price for it at some point. But sometimes we need to be willing to take the risk and just trust it's not going to be received well because what you're telling somebody is they're wrong and nobody likes being told they're wrong. But here's the thing. There may be a chance that they go, huh, maybe you're right. You think about the story of Jonah. Jonah was told to go to Nineveh because he needed to preach to these people and they were supposed to repent. And he goes, I don't want to go to them. And it wasn't because he, he didn't like those people. And he goes, I don't want to tell them because they might repent. I want them all to go to hell. <laughs> so he goes the opposite way, <laughs> right? We have to take the risk of telling the truth and being honest with people if we truly love them. But it's not going to necessarily be received well. But here's the thing. Maybe it will be received well. And they'll get even wiser still. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Again, the fear of the Lord is recognition. I got to do what God's asked me to do because I'm responsible to him with my life. Even if it costs me something to speak the truth to them. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding for through wisdom, your days will be many and years will be added to your life. If you're wise, your wisdom will reward you. If you're a mocker, you alone will suffer. Which here brings me to my second point. Wise people receive correction. Fools don't. If you're going to grow in your walk with God, if you're going to become all God intends for you to be, you're going to have to receive the correction that God wants to give you. And here's the crazy part. Sometimes it'll come from people you just don't even like. And God will often use people you don't like to speak biblical truth into your life. And here's the thing. Even if you don't like them and you don't like the way they're living, if they're speaking something that lines up with what God says is for you, you need to listen. Even if you don't like their tone. Now, I want to talk about something real quick because I know that some of you feel like your mission in life is to correct those people who are wrong online. Right? You don't have to raise your hand, but I know some of y'all, okay? I want to look at something really quick, a reality here. This is reality. This is statistics from the U.S. Department of Education, okay? 54% of adults in the United States lack English literacy proficiency. You know what that means? 
I'm not trying to insult anybody, but it means half the population can't read very good. Okay, now hold on. I'm getting somewhere with this. Okay, I'm not trying to insult anybody, but I'm just saying this is a reality we deal with. Over 20% of adult Americans have a literacy proficiency at or below level one. And here's what that means. Adults in this range have difficulty using or understanding print materials, stuff in writing online. Adults below level one may only understand very basic vocabulary or be functionally illiterate. Now, here's something really important to understand. Those people who are coming after you online, fighting with you online, there's a really good possibility they didn't even understand what they were reading. And arguing with them is pointless because they didn't even understand. And you can use a lot of words and even bigger words, but look, they have a limited vocabulary. Now you're like, whoa, are you t- what? this is a reality. This is just a reality. We come to church to deal with reality. But here's the really scary part about this. If 50% of the people can't read that well and process things well, half of us in here get stuff wrong all the time. We may have not even read it right. We may have misinterpreted what it said, which causes us to have or need to have a lot of humility. And in every instance where we hear something we don't like, we still have to go with this. What if they're right? Humility acknowledges I'm probably wrong. And sometimes it has to be blared back into our own ears for us to go, whoa, I got that one wrong. But, but, but here's the thing. When we find out we've been wrong about something, we need to do this. We need to say, what do I need to do to get in line with reality? And that may mean humbly acknowledging to somebody I didn't like your tone at all, but thank you for bringing that to my attention. I don't agree with you on anything else, but what you're saying there is true. And I need to get myself in line with that. Thank you. And here's what's really tricky about it. There are going to be times when people criticize you and stuff, and it's not based on anything biblical. But sometimes it's really hard to know what the way is to take. And that's the beauty of why we have been left with the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity, Jesus, right before he left the earth, he said, guys, there's a bunch more stuff I want to show you. There's a lot of truth out there I want to show you, but basically you can't handle the truth, right? So right now I'm going to leave, but I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit and he is going to come and he's going to guide you in all truth and wisdom as you're ready for it. And that's the beautiful thing because in this complicated world of all sorts of weird relational challenges and complexities and stuff, you're like, what's the wise thing to do here? If you'll ask of God, the Holy Spirit will give you wisdom. And oftentimes what he'll do is he'll direct you to a passage that you've been reading in Proverbs and you'll read it for that day and you'll go, oh, this is the exact thing I need to do to deal with my boss. This is the exact reality I'm dealing with with my son who just has lost his mind. And I'm like, I didn't raise him this way. This is the exact thing I need to know to deal with my husband. This is, oh, that's what my wife said, and she was right. Or, oh, my husband was right always. (laughs) Just kidding. All right. But seriously, we have to be open to correction, y'all, if we're going to grow and become all God wants us to be. Because listen to me, the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn. It shines brighter and brighter. But sometimes what that's going to mean is we need to just be course corrected a little bit. And we may not like their tone. We may not like who said it. But our job, our goal is to be wise people in this crazy world who are living in line with reality and realizing, man, if the more I get in line with the reality, the more the blessing of the Lord flows in my life. You guys receive that? I believe y'all can be wise people. Lord, we thank you this morning that you're offering us wisdom. It's calling out. Wisdom's calling from her house. Hey, come here. I got some wisdom for you. So I thank you, Lord, that you have given us access to that through the word of God and through the Holy Spirit guiding us through the word of God. So I thank you, Lord, for, for the wisdom that we need to navigate everything we're going through this morning. If you're here this morning, you've not given your life to Jesus. I'm going to give you a chance to do that. Uh, it, It's not a magic formula or anything, but if you say this prayer and you mean it in your heart, God is going to come and forgive your sin, transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness, set you up with him in eternity. It starts when we say this prayer. Let's say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We got some resources for you there under the do it again sign. Man, stop by the pavilion on the way out. It's a beautiful day. Go enjoy it. Meet some people. Be wise this week. Be blessed. Have a great week. If you are ever in the Seguin area, 
come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings. <laughs>